or don't, don't, and I don't think that it can't be taken away from you. The favor that he bestowed upon you, he's al Mu'ti, he's al Mani. He can give, but he can take it away. The favor of faith, that you've done nothing to deserve, you've done nothing to deserve it. And it's one of the greatest favors, but you've done nothing to deserve it. It can be taken away if we're ungrateful. And there are people who need it, who want it, who need it. It can be given to them instead of, instead of you and I. Which is why we should appreciate the favor of being connected to Allah and the Messenger more than anything else that we have. More than anything else that we have. The mere fact we know somebody called Muhammad. And we can say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we can say we're connected to him. And we can say he will be my Shafi'i Yawm al Qiyam. He will be my intercessor. In a hadith, the Prophet he said, he mentioned that when Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, when Prophet Musa alayhi salam, when he received the tablets, the Alwah on Mount Sinai, he's reading the tablets. And, and on the tablets, in the revelation that comes to him, he reads the descriptions of, a, of an ummah, of a community. And when he re- reads these amazing descriptions, he says, Allahumma ja'alha ummati. Allah, make this my ummah, make this my community. He said, Allah, the reply comes, it's not your community. Second time, Allah, make this my community. It's not your community. Third time, Allah, make this my community. Innaha ummatu Ahmed. This is the ummah of Ahmed. So what's he say? Allah, maj'alni min ummati Ahmed. Allah, make me from the ummah of Ahmed. And you hear what's, what's, what's important to take out of this. It's not the fact that, that the greatness of this ummah, that those who are connected to, to the Prophet, it's a Sayyidina Musa Islam wants to be, to be part of this ummah. But he wasn't given it. You and I have been given it. You and I have been given something that one of the five greatest human beings who have ever lived yearned for, asked for, but he wasn't given it. To be part and connected to Sayyidina Muhammad. Without you and I asking or trying anything, we've been given it. So appreciate that favor, lest it, lest it be taken away from us, because it can be taken away from us. Rabbul Izza, he can deal with us however he sees fit. He can take it away from us. Appreciate the favor that Allah subhanahu has bestowed. Appreciate the favor that Muhammad sallallahu has bestowed upon us. When we start understanding that, then Sharia becomes very easy to accept. Then law becomes very easy to accept. It, it doesn't become difficult because the question was or the discussion was about how males should, should interact with females the answer is quite easy quite easy and, I, and as I said at the beginning the answer everybody here knows it everybody here knows what's halal and haram Prophet Muhammad said Al halal ubayyin wal haram ubayyin halal is clear haram is clear wa baynahuma umurun mutashabi or mushtabihat in between there are unclear, there are unclear matters. But this is clear, halal is clear, haram is clear. You don't need a mufti, an alim, a scholar to come and tell you that drinking alcohol is haram. You don't need that. You don't need some scholar to come and tell you that as a Muslim you've got to pray five times a day. You don't need that. That as a, as a Muslim woman that it's a liberty to cover herself. As, as the Prophet was described, you don't need anybody to tell you that. If you don't accept it, that's your business. But what's halal and haram is clear. And uh, you don't want to accept that. Then you need to look at your relationship with Allah and the Messenger. And uh, why is it that I can't submit? Why is it that I can't submit? There's factors now here that need to be considered. So when we're talking about how should a male and female interact with each other, it's clear. It's clear. And there's no point going through the details of this. Like, can a man and a woman be alone? That's clear. Be alone in complete privacy. The Prophet clearly said that. He said that if a man and a woman are alone, shaitan will be the third of them. And he said, he said, he said in another hadith, never be alone. Never be alone with a woman. He said, even if it's Maryam, the mother of Isa. He said, even if it's Maryam, the mother of Isa. The holiest, one of the, one of the holiest women. To whom no thought of haram would come when she sees the angel come in human form. What she say? Inni a'udhu bil rahmani minka. That I take refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from you. Her first thought is a'udhu billah. That she's alone with a male. That she's alone with a male. That here there's no, absolutely no issue whatsoever. Halal is clear. Haram is clear. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you this is haram, this is haram, this is haram. 
If you look into your heart, halal is clear and haram is clear. But what we, know, what we really need to look at is why is it that even though, like, pe like people are saying like this issue about um, gender interactions and so on, like how should it take place? People know that five times prayer is far, but people don't do it. They know it's far, but they don't do it. There are people who know, every Muslim here can tell me, is backbiting haram? Nobody's going to say it's haram. Why do you backbite them? Why is it when you sit at home, you're always talking about other people? The issue is not about knowing what's halal and haram, that's clear. So, in terms of, can a man shake and touch the, the, the hand of a woman? It's clear. It's clear, these issues are clear. And you don't need, and, and you shouldn't start looking for, I mean, one of the dangers is now to start, to start looking for things that will justify your bad state. If you're in a state that you're distant from Allah SWT, don't start trying to twist statements, twist hadith, look for an ayah in Quran that will justify your way. Don't start doing that. Admit that I need to move, I need to change, I need to reconnect with the messenger. That there's something between me and the messenger, something that's distant me from him, that I can't emulate him, I can't emulate his wives. As a man, I can't emulate him. As a woman, I can't emulate Sayyidah Fatima. I can't emulate Sayyidah Khadija. Like, what is it between me and him that's causing that barrier? And that's really what we need to look at. Because haram is begging. The haram is clear. And if people want to discuss it, we can discuss the details in, in the question time at the end. But the important thing to understand is don't your, let your nafs get in the way of what's halal and haram. Don't let yourself get in the way of what's halal and haram. Know that haram is haram. And the worst thing that you can do is to try and justify your wrong actions. And in some situations, it can, be, it can undermine the very basis of your faith. It can remove you out of being a Muslim. Some, if some Muslim now says, look, I, I don't pray. I, I don't pray. But I don't cover myself. And we say, okay, you're a Muslim. But you're not, I mean, it's not a good state to be really a Muslim. I don't need to pray. That's dangerous now for your faith. That's dangerous now for your faith. You're challenging Allah. You're not challenging me. You're challenging your Lord. Your Lord's told you to pray and say, I don't need to pray. You're challenging Allah. You're challenging Muhammad. You're not challenging me. I'm not a lawmaker. I'm not sitting here passing judgments over people. You challenge the one who passed that original judgment. That's where you should be careful. So people here, the really important discussion now here is, what's stopping me from getting closer to Allah? What's that barrier? And here... I should, we'll finish quickly, but there are two key barriers, particularly on this issue that we're talking about. Particularly on the issue that we're talking about. There are four main barriers or hurdles that prevent a person getting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A nafs, a shaitan, a dunya, well ashab. Nafs, your own self. Your own self. Shaitan is the second one. And remember, in, in the hierarchy, everybody blames shaitan. It's yourself. First and foremost is yourself. Shaitan is secondary. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna kayda shaitan kana ba'ifa. That the strategy of shaitan, i.e. to lead you astray, it's weak. It's weak. What causes you to go astray is not shaitan. He just puts ideas in your mind. He just whispers. How easy is it to turn him away? Just say, Aaudhu billahi min shaitan rajim. He's gone. Do dhikr of Allah. He's gone. He's weak. Do dhikr of Allah. He's gone. Read Quran. He's gone. Adhan. He's gone. Shaitan is weak. What's the one that you really need to struggle against? Not shaitan, yourself. How do we know that? Look at the month of Ramadan. The month of Ramadan is an eye opener for everybody. You're blaming shaitan all the time. He's not there. But you're still, you're still behaving as you were. What happens in Ramadan? Everybody gets this emotional boost for the first couple of days. They're there for Taraweeh. They fast and weigh really good. <coughs> then he dies down after a few days. And like through the rest of the month, it's a struggle, they're back, they're seeing now, because what's Ramadan showing you? This is where you're at with your law. This is your nest, this is where you're at. And then what happens at the very end? At the very end, you're back on a high. The last, like, 27th, everybody's in the mosque, and 20, 29th, we're finishing off the month, you're back <coughs> on a high again. Well, what happened throughout the rest of that month? It was you and Allah, at that point, Shaitan wasn't there. It was you and Allah, that shows you, that, that shows you how distant you are from Allah, subhanahu Shaitan is not insignificant. Because look at what happens in Ramadan. On the very last night of Ramadan, the mosque is full. Fajr, for Eid prayer, empty. What happened? Shaitan's been released again. He's back. He's back. He's putting his suggestions again. 
two days, one after the other, what changed in those two days? Shape R. He's not insignificant, but the real issue is yourself. So when we're looking at, like somebody's like, somebody likes, like, likes to keep the company of the office agenda, likes to hang out with somebody say, look at you and ask, where's it at? Where's it at? Because you know clearly what you're doing should not be done. You know that clearly. And you know that the messenger to be sent as a mercy to you, and he will help you in the next world. He's told you not to do that. So who are you rebelling against? The one who's a mercy to you. The one who's a, what are you like? You're just like a rebellious child. A rebellious who thinks that I've got some independence, I'm free, I've got some independence. You're just behaving like a rebellious child against a loving father and mother who's trying to bring you back onto the straight and narrow. But look who's that? Who's the one who's trying to bring you back? He's a rahmat and alameen. That's who you're rebelling against. That should hurt your heart when you sit down. When you sit down and reflect over where I'm at. Like doesn't it pain you that the Prophet is aware of what I'm doing and it upsets him. It upsets him. And unfortunately we're from those categories. Potentially in the Ladina Yudun Allah wa Rasulahu. لَعْنَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ Those who harm Allah and the Messenger, Allah SWT curses them in this world and the next world. Do our actions not harm the Messenger? Does he not feel pain at the fact that I'm living a life he gave everything to bring you to Allah SWT and you don't even care about it? He gave everything whatsoever. Like, like, like the hadith in the Shema Imam Tirmidhi mentions, he was in a constant state of grief. Grief for what? For you and I? for humankind, because he knew what hellfire was like. He'd seen hellfire. He'd seen hellfire. He knew what hellfire was like. In his own masjid, in the hadith in Bukhari, Muslim, it says that he's in the masjid, Sahaba looking at him, and he, and he goes out like that to grab something, and then suddenly he moves back. He asked him, what are you doing? He said, the veils were lifted, and he, saw, he said, I saw heaven, and he saw the fruits, and he said, I went to grasp the fruits of heaven, but I was told, not yet. It's not the time for you to take from those fruits. So then suddenly hellfire was opened up and he said, I saw it. He said, because the ferocity of, of the flames, he said, I moved back. He saw hellfire. That's why he was in constant states of grief. So we're the, we the real ones who do doing the harm. We're harming Allah SWT. Not harming, we're harming the messenger, but we're harming ourselves. Right? And here we have to stop behaving like rebellious children and start submitting to the one who wants to save us in this world before the next world. He wants to save us from our own selves. Remember the statement of the Prophet <laughs> The worst enemy that you have is that which is between your two sides. Yourself. Your own self. So when you're doing haram, when you're with, the, when you're with that female doing haram, known full well that what I'm doing is not right. Known full well that if that was my sister and I knew some guy was with my sister, I'm not going to be happy with that. But then you don't care, it's a sister of somebody else. Like that young, like that young Ansari, this, the Sahabi from Medina comes to proselytize him, and he makes a statement which is, is an eye-opener. He says, It then leave his zina. He says, Allow me to fornicate. Comes to the Prophet and says, Allow me to fornicate. Like, somebody comes to you now and says that, I'm gonna do it. I don't care. Like, what's the reaction gonna be? Exactly how the Sahaba reacted. They were about to they were about to jump on him at that point. That you come to the messenger and ask him such a question. Proselytism calms them all down. And this is the rahmah of the proselyte. This is the Ustad al Kamil, the perfect teacher. What does he say to him? And he uses intellect first, rational. He says, Would you like that to happen to your own sister? No. Your mother? No. Your daughter? No. How can you then, how can you then be happy that that's happening to the daughters of the believers? You're okay with that for somebody else's daughter, but not your own. You're okay with that somebody else's sister, but not your own. And then what do you do? Places his hands, his blessed hand on the heart of that Sahabi. He says, Allahumma, Allahumma tahir qalbahu, wa zakki qalbahu, wa hassin farjahu. Allah, cleanse his heart and protect his modesty. And that Sahabi at that point said, I never ever felt the urge to do haram after that. Because the blessings are the prayer of the Prophet. And here, it's our nest that we've got to look at. Like, why is it that my own self is pulling me down? My own self is, try is willing to destroy me with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's willing to push me into, in, into destruction on that day. No. Don't think, 
Don't ask her what's halal and haram. Haram is bayi and haram is clear. We don't need to discuss that. The question is why am I willing to why am I willing to forego all of the khair that the Prophet has given us? All of that goodness that he's given us. Why am I willing to abandon that? That's the first that you've got to overcome. The second that the brother mentioned in the introduction, the, f the second major hurdle or barrier that causes these problems to happen is that we live in a non-Muslim society. And don't ever underestimate that. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me by being able to live in a Muslim now for three years. I was in Damascus for three years. And one of the striking things there is that when you're around Muslims, Muslims are wah tayyiba, pure souls. Pure souls meaning what? Souls that have submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, good or bad. There may well be a lot of bad Muslims, and there are a lot of, a lot of bad Muslims. We're not trying to paint out a utopian picture about what the Muslim world There's a lot of bad in the Muslim world, but these are souls that have accepted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the advices that I heard before I left to go to Damascus, go to Syria, was that you're leaving a land where the overwhelming majority of people have rebelled against God Almighty. And you go into a land where the overwhelming majority of people have submitted to God Almighty. The states of people affect you. When you're surrounded by goodness all the time, it will have a good effect upon you. The Prophet described that in the hadith where he said, he compared it, that if you're, somebody sells perfume all the time, if you're always with that person, all you can get is pleasant, pleasant fragrance coming off, off that. Off the. But if you're around somebody, a fire, like an ironmonger, then at the very least you're going to be covered in smoke. That's what's happened to us now. We're covered in smoke. We're covered in smoke. And the haram that the non-Muslim is doing, it's easy for us to do it because we're around haram all the time. When we talk about gender interaction, say, particularly at universities, particularly at universities where, it's, where it's, it's open haram, there's no consideration for what's, there's no consideration, don't think you won't be affected by it. And now, you know, when you look at this, the Prophet some foretold in Akhir al-Zaman, there will come a time where you're holding on to your religions like holding on to burning charcoal. Those who want to hold on to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala messenger, it's as difficult as holding on to burning charcoal. Like one of the, just, just two last points here. In Guantanamo, one of the methods that the Americans used to torture, one of the methods that they used to tor torture, it's, it's, it's amazing that this, this method of torture, they would bring prostitutes in, they would have pornographic films on, for people who came from villages in Afghanistan and Yemen, they couldn't cope with that. That was torture. This is reported. They, they would break down when they saw some because they'd, they'd never seen haram of that type before. That was torture for them. For Muslims from the West, it meant nothing to them. Why? Because you've been exposed to it all. You've seen it all. Exposed to all that type of haram such that looking at a face woman has no effect whatsoever because you've seen far, far worse. That's why it was torture for people who'd never been exposed to it. The idea of looking at something like that, for Muslims who'd been captured from the West, it was absolutely normal for them. What's that tell you? You're absolutely covered in filth. We're absolutely immersed in filth. Another observation somebody made to me, you will, it's very rare, rare, and you probably never find a case in, in, in the West where a Muslim man or woman will get married and has never seen, and has never seen a person naked before. That was a norm in Muslim society. We're all exposed to haram. You'll never find a man and woman get together now, or very rare, where they've never seen something that, some, some nudity. That used to be an absolute norm. What effect does that now have in terms of your marriage? And that's something you're going to have a lecture, you're going to have a session on Sheikh Ahmed Jamil will come and speak to you about that. But that has a powerful effect, a, a negative effect in your marriage. Those are thoughts that we need to consider. But ultimately, I mean, the effect of society itself, we have to understand that society has such a powerful effect upon us. Don't think that we live in a completely neutral society. We were educated in institutions. You're being educated in an institution whose primary purpose is to strip you of belief. Primary purpose of, of, of school, of college, of university, these are secular institutes. They don't give you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't give you Rasulullah Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa What's that going to do? It's going to strip away from you, Iman. I mean, these are things that, okay, 
these are necessities, these are things that are needed when say you have to get an education. But don't think that it's neutral. Don't think that you studying three years in university has no effect upon your iman. It has a powerful negative effect upon your iman. So here all all, all I want to suggest for us all is that you think about these matters. Think first and foremost about our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think about our connection with the Prophet, and particularly because we're entering into the month where the gift was given to us. Think about these matters. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. جزاك الله خير. We're gonna have a question and answer session now. So some paper going around and some pens. So if you can ask a question, can you please write the question down on the paper and collect it in five minutes? Then we'll be going to the question and answer session shortly. جزاك الله خير.